us to look up 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel chapter 3, 23. I'll be there directly, Cheryl. I'm going to go in order here, so there's nothing but just giving you guys a heads up. 2 Samuel chapter 23. Again, we welcome all the fathers, grandpas, and guardians. Amen of the galaxy. Good to have all of you here. You know, I want to pick up a, a biblical principle this morning on how men became men, Old Testament, New Testament wise, the importance of honor, the importance of connections. Paul called us to be good soldiers, what Timothy said, be a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Ephesians 6 in the New Testament says, put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. The full armor talked about a sword and a helmet and a breastplate and a shield, and your feet shod. It walks you through that. You know, the people you are connected to will either stretch your vision or they're going to choke your dream. It's so important who you've got hanging out with you. And not everybody has a right to speak into your life. And some people think they do, particularly in this social media age. You know, respect those whom God has connected to you to help you. Don't demand, but your life should command respect. Let me say that again. Don't demand respect, but you should live a life that commands respect and honor. And that's what we're looking for in our men and our fathers today. So wise is the man who fortifies his life with the right relationships. The scripture is full of illustrations concerning connections. Jonathan, Saul's son, Saul David, heard David, and his soul was knit to him. That's a divine connection. And then there's Paul, Paul the apostle. And his life is full of right relationships. The scripture speaks very little of his relationships before he was Paul. When he was Silas, he was just a man. Uh, uh, see, when he was Saul, he was just a man who was after killing Christians. But as Paul, he became a man with relationships with a man like Silas, Barnabas, his brothers, Timothy, a spiritual son, and even Simon Peter he connected with. We, uh, um, we're out on the tower working with what we call the OCDs, and this shirt was made for that moment. And it says on it, I got your back. And I think about this phrase this week, I got your back. Because when you're out on the, this tower, this, these implements, it's a 40-foot tower, two 300-foot zip lines, it's a 50-foot swing, that if you don't watch after one another, somebody could get seriously hurt. And we've been doing this for about mm, 12, 15 years. I forget how long we've been doing it. But we watch one another. We observe one another. And, and we don't, it's not a rebuke, but it's a correction at times that we correct and say, hey, make sure that's on correctly or that's done right, that harness is done right. So it's important to us that, and, and then I've had people in the military my whole life who've come up to me and shook hands with me and put a coin in my hand and tell me they got my six, which is another, another name for I got your back. I'm going to look after you. I got, I mean, so keep this coin to remind you of that moment. Those are moving. My dad was in the military. My grandpa uh, was a, a paratrooper in World War II. You know, these are things that mean something. So when I read Scripture, I, I pick up on this militant idea. And if we're not careful in this age of 2021, we will forget just how militant we should be. And as I speak this, ladies, you're just going to have to put this into context into your life. I'm not real culturally, culturally relevant. Are you hearing me? When the Bible speaks of men, I talk about men. When it speaks of woman, I, spoke, I talk about woman. Amen. The wombed man, if you would. That's literally what she uh, is that God created her. And so when I understand creation, I pick up on that. And by the way, if you are self-centered... Bitter, if you have a low self-esteem and you have a fear of rejection, this message somewhere in the middle of it is going to offend you. Just going to give you a heads up, a disclaimer in the beginning of the movie. All right? Amen. I'm going to say it again. If you have low self-esteem, if you're bitter, self-centered, amen, you got a fear of rejection, I'm probably going to get you somewhere, and uh, we'll see you again next year. <laughs> Proverbs 18.24, are you comfortable? I'll read these two scriptures, then we'll go into Samuel. How about that? The scripture says, friends come and friends go, but a true friend sticks by you like family. Friends come and friends go, but a true friend sticks to you like family. Proverbs 17, 17, at all times a friend loves, but in adversity he is born or becomes a brother. 
me say it like this. A brother is more than a friend. He stands to one nearer than a friend does. It is the adversities that tells you who your friends are. In other words, when you had adversity in life, it introduced you to your brother. Sister, you can take this the same way. But it's through adversities in life that I've met my brothers. I had a young man call me yesterday, 50 years old. He said, Pastor, I just want to talk to you. I wanted to hear your voice. It's been many years. You were my pastor, my friend, and I have cancer, and I need to talk to you. Amen. So I had a good conversation with him. I had a call last night. Pastor, you're the only guy that I know that can do uh, our sister's funeral. She just passed away. She was a friend. She, was re she rededicated her life through your ministry. I know it's been 20 years, but would you do her funeral on Tuesday? I'd be proud to do her funeral on Tuesday. I consider it an honor. Amen. Again, you don't demand honor. You don't demand, but your life should command it. Amen. In such a way that people will remember you. And the scripture says in 2 Samuel chapter 23, we want to talk to you about a man by the name of David. Yeah, King David. During harvest time, there on the 30, we're going to start in verse 13. Uh, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David at the cave of Adullam. You remember David would always run to the cave. He was a cave dweller, man. He liked being in the woods. And Saul, King Saul's after him to kill him. Amen. The king, the man he looked to as a daddy. We'll talk more about him in a minute. But here he's running. He's in the cave of Adullam. While a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephidim. At that time, David was in the stronghold, the cave. And the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water. He said, oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. Now, let me say this to you. When you are in a position of uh, uh, influence, be careful what you say out loud. Amen. Because people who love you, Daddy, people who love you, sir, they will hear your voice. And next thing you know, you will find them trying to make that happen for you. Many years ago, I walked out of a church singing, Honolulu, Honolulu, and I was just kidding, Honolulu, Honolulu, and a man bought me tickets to Maui. I had a little Harley sitting up on my shelf, and next thing I know, the church bought me a Harley. I, I've had two churches buy me two Harleys. Now, that doesn't mean I haven't given away things. I just got to be careful what I speak. I say things, and things happen. Sir, it happens to you, too. You may not recognize it or understand it, but one day your influence will be that way where people will listen. David said, oh, if I could just have a drink of cold, cool water, amen, near the gate of Bethlehem. So three of the mighty warriors broke through the Philistine line drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, carried it back to David. Watch this. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. And he said, Far be it from me, Lord, to do this. He said, It is not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives, and David would not drink it. Such were his exploits of the three mighty warriors. Very important here to understand that David understood they were honoring him, but he honored them by pouring that thing out as a sacrifice. And said, You know, guys, I was just tatted, talking out of my head here. Now, Abishai the brother of Joab, son of Zeruel, was chief of the three. He raised the spear against 300 men. You want to talk about some bad, bad brothers? Come on, come on. I'm talking, you know, we, we hear about this stuff. Listen to this. This man took a spear against 300 men whom he killed, and so he became as famous as the three. Today we lift up superstars who flop. <laughs> Get hurt too easy. Can't endure. We just throw them up there and say, oh, man, that's, that's who I'm after. Not these guys. Three, this life and death, 300 of them. Was he not held in greater honor than the three? He became their commander, even though he was not included among them. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant fighter from Kabzil, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. That's a bad man. Look down in a, listen, when you jump down into a pit to take on a lion on a snowy day, you're saying only one of us is coming out of here. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. He did that. Verse 21, and he struck down a huge Egyptian. Although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaiah went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benaiah and Jehoiada. He, too, was a famous as the three mighty warriors. <laughs> Three of them I want to mention to you real quick. Joab, one of David's commanders. 
The problem with Joab was this. Joab was faithful as long as his position wasn't threatened. Some children are all right as long as they feel like their posi position isn't threatened in the family. Some people in church, they all right as long as they feel like their position isn't threatened. So they'll be faithful as long. That was Joab. Abishai, amen, was faithful to the man of God. So much so, it, you know, sometimes, listen, I understand my flaws. They're pre pretty much blaring. You know, people kind of know them. And because of that, it's important for you not to lift a pastor, a man of God, a woman of God too high. Amen. Esteem them because of their position. Amen. Deal with them and still love them because of their personality. Okay? Amen. Because I know I'm not everybody's cup of tea. I will grate you. Uh, not grade you. Grate you. I, you know, like a cheese grater. I mean, just, I know I annoy. I understand that. I'm, I'm not just a pastor. I'm a pester. Now, Abishag, that was him. But Benaiah was faithful to the God of the man. And this is the issue. Be faithful to God, the God of the man. Amen. Love the God of the man. That's where we, that was the big difference here. Father, I thank you for the words of God. I thank you for the warriors that work with David. I thank you for the understanding and learning today. It's not a normal Father's Day for us here today. We want our men to understand what it's like to be a man. In Jesus' name, and everyone shout. Amen. Amen. God bless. Come on, give me a big shout. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Maybe see it. I already got you upset. These were David's armor bearers, so along with Joab. The first three, of course, were Eliezer, Adina, and Shammah. Amen. I've preached on these guys, you know, individually, but seeing them all together. They were known as armor bearer. Everybody say armor bearer. Armor bearer. Amen. Say it again. Armor. armor bearer. He was an armor bearer. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 21 says, And David came to Saul, King Saul, chapter 16, 1 Samuel, and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, speaking that Saul loved David greatly, and he became his armor bearer. The issue with this scripture, I want you to notice this, this is before David kills Goliath. That's important to understand, because sometimes we see David showing up in the issue of Goliath, and it's like the first introduction with Saul. It didn't happen. David was already an armor bearer. He was already a fighter. He was already somebody who understood war, amen, before this ever happened, amen. And he loved Saul as a father. He, lo he was looking for, and I believe children are doing that today. They're looking for men to be dads to them. I just want somebody to be a father, a mentor, somebody to help teach me. I want to watch you, you know, and I found out a long time ago, it doesn't have uh, much to do with DNA. It has something more to do with the spirit. Amen. The attitude of the guardian and the person they're looking up to. He was that armor bearer. Fathers and are, are looking to be mentors for sons and daughters and vice versa. The armor bearer, three things I'll throw at you real quickly here, was a person selected by prominent officers to first bear the armor, second to stand by them in danger, and three to carry out orders. First was to bear the armor. In other words, they stood before them with armor. They protected them. They looked after them. Now you say, Pastor, how does this apply? to today. I'm going to tell you how it applies. We, as we grow in this life, we need people that will stand and keep armor for us. Amen. You need certain, sir. I need it, sir. Amen. We, we need to have that. To carry them in dangerous times and to carry out orders. This, I believe, is where brothers and dads are missing it at times. We just think we just need to be all the time. But no, I need to protect my family. Amen. I need to keep them from danger. Hallelujah. And I need to carry out orders from God. So first, servant to hear or to bear the armor. At the heart of this ministry is the gift of serving. 452 times in scriptures it talk about serving. Jesus said it for us to serve one another. He taught us by washing the feet of the disciples in John chapter 13 to wash, to look after, to serve. That is the spirit of an armor bearer. There are many times in life, this is what I find, we do it but we don't understand the definition of it. We've been to it. Last night, uh, or yesterday evening, uh, my daughter Jill walks in. She says, Pastor, I just want to watch something about history. So I kicked on Braveheart. How many understand that was history? William Wallace was history, the Scottish uh, warrior that he was. And if you watch the show, you'll realize that men came to him as armor bearers. They just wanted to protect him. He didn't ask for it. They just came. And you see it in other shows we watch. And you'll, you'll even pick it up in some of today's vernacular. Amen. But very important to be a servant. Exodus 33, 11 says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face, as a man speaks unto his friend. And he turned again unto the camp, but his servant, 
Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. When you study this, the life of Moses and Joshua, and we'll throw in Caleb, Joshua wouldn't leave Moses. He attended him. Elisha wouldn't leave Elijah. He attended him. Jonathan loved David. Their hearts were knit together. There was an attention to this thing. They served one another. So the second thing I see here is security. The armor bearer to stand by in danger. Do you know there are times that I will call a brother just to check on him because I think he's in danger? I will call and check on them. Amen. I would call home. I call, I'll call home on my way home, on, on the way to the next church to check on my mom. Amen. We look after one another. We watch one another. The scripture calls us first to work out our own salvation. I know that, but it also tells us that we are our brothers and sisters keepers. Amen. And if you want to be a good dad, you're going to call him kids. You know, my daughter called me. My, my wife looked at me like that. She said, Well, that Mandy again. I said, Yeah. She done called me twice in two hours. Amen. My daughter has the same traveling bone I do. When I'm traveling, I'm calling. I just don't sit in that car. I've got to call somebody. When she traveled to, I know she got, you just got off from work, didn't you, girl? Uh-huh. She wants to call. And we just talk. We just talk. But it secures me as a dad because I'm 800 miles away from her. Amen. It helps to make that connection in my life. you got to make that phone call. We're called to secure our families, one another. Sensitivity. That armor bearer was sensitive to the needs of the one around him. Sensitivity is powerful. Receptive to sense, amen, impressions, highly responsive. Let me speak to you as, as your pastor just a little bit. Many of you have become sensitive to me. As a matter of fact, I walked in with this shirt, and you knew immediately something is off today. You have never seen me in a short sleeve shirt on a Sunday morning. But you know what I decided? I'm a dad, too. So I think I'll look like a dad. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm a pawpaw. If I could have had the kid, grandkids first, <laughs> I'd have got them first. Amen. I just skipped right over them kids. Amen. Just went right on to the grands. Hallelujah. But, but that's not the way it is. Sensitivity is very sensitive to the surroundings. You know, sensitive. Do they need a drink? Uh, security. You may not know this, but I know who has a gun in this house. And I, and I know who can use it. That's why I've always said, if, some, if you ever hear a gun go off in this house, just get down. Don't jump up and say, what? Don't do that. If you just get down, our ladies should take care of the intruder. Oh, women shoot better than our men in here. Hey, Amen. They're a little more calm about it all. And, then they, they, and, and plus, not only that, they don't feel guilty about shooting something. But be sensitive to the surroundings. When you, when you as, as, a, as a child toward a parent, be sensitive. As you get older and understand what a blessing they are in your life, be sensitive toward your parents. Be sensitive toward dad. Amen. To what he's done. I took a picture of three things. Uh, my inheritance. You know what my inheritance was when my dad died? My mom gave me a ring. I have that. A little gold ring. It was a pinky ring in my pops. And I got his level. His Aladdin, uh, his, uh, not Aladdin, what's that thing, that green thermos. Stanley, green thermos, got a dent in it. And his level, his wooden level, a wooden level, with dog chew marks on the end of it. And his Gibson banjo. That was my inheritance. And I took a picture of it and posted it today. Because it reminded me of a man that built his own house. Of a man that brought his coffee to Tennessee Valley Authority before he retired. Of a man in solace, my dad would play a banjo. And when my dad played a banjo, you know, unlike my kids, I'm always inviting my kids in. They can interrupt me any time they do. <laughs> but I never interrupted my dad when he's playing his banjo. My dad would take that banjo and he'd walk behind the house and he'd sit on the well house. We called it a well house. Dug our own well. He dug his own well. He, man, he'd sit on that well and he'd pick that, that Gibson. And he'd cuss that banjo. He just, I don't know, it never helped. <laughs> it still sounded like the same old banjo to me. But he'd talk to himself, he'd play that, but I never interrupted him because that was his place of solace. I was sensitive to it. I understand just what Pop liked. Amen. To have that sensitivity. And when you're around leaders, you need to watch. When you, you work for somebody, an employer, watch. Be sensitive to them. If you want to be promoted, you want to understand life, you want to get along and keep that job a long time, be sensitive to your employer. Amen. What is it their needs are? What is it they got? So the issue here is I got you back. Everybody say I got you back. Got you back. Amen. First Samuel chapter 14, verse 1. I'm going to throw another one at you here. This, this is not one familiar to a lot of people. One day Jonathan, son of Saul. This is before David enters into this situation. Son of Saul said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. So two guys. But he did not tell his dad. 
Now, I know there's not a single guy in here that did something in their lives and you always told your daddy what you was going to do. <laughs> you always told Pop what you're going to do. I used to put my Dodge Charger up in the woods. I'd park it up there. I'd go in and say, Mom, Dad, I'm home. All right, son, go to bed. All right. I'd coast that Dodge off the, out of them woods. I'd put it in second gear, head down Flatwoods Road, pop that clutch, whoa, get on out of the way. My dad, I never told him, but my mom squealed on me. <laughs> One day, Jonathan, son of Saul, and a young armor bearer said, come, let's go over. Didn't tell his daddy. Oh, should be Saul. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gilba under a pomegranate tree in Migran. With him were about 600 men. Let me just say this to you. Jonathan was frustrated with a dad who had an army that would not fight the Philistines. He was upset that his dad wouldn't step up and do something for the kingdom of God. So he decided, I'm going to do something. So he grabs his armor bearer, and he goes, listen to me. There are times, dads, we, we, we hold our kids back too much. We need to release them, let them go. Amen. When there comes a time when you just got to say, you know, you know if, if God wants you to do that, you get on out there and do it. Amen. Among whom was Ab Ahijah. Amen. Who was wearing an ephod? He was on the sun. We can skip that verse right there. Amen. Go on down to verse 4. On each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One's called Bozi. Amen. The other is Sinai. One cliff stood to the north, another one uh, to the south. Amen. Jonathan said to the young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost. Uh, those uncircumcised men, the Philistines. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. I love when the Old Testament, it, it gives us uh, credence to the New Testament. Amen. It begins to say there's nothing impossible with God. That's what he's saying here. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And then the armor bearer said to him, do all that you have in mind. Amen. Go ahead. I'm with your heart and soul. Oh, man, this is good. I will your heart and soul. Jonathan said, well, come on then. We'll cross over toward them and let them see us. Watch this. Now, this is tremendous common sense. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we'll stay where we are and not go up to them. That means they're going to come down here and kill us. But if they say, come up to us, we'll climb up the cliff because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. Does anybody see any common sense at all in that? I mean, these are like two teenage boys. <laughs> Come in. What, I mean, this is what he said. If we, we'll show ourselves to them, and if they say, wait, we'll wait on them. They'll come down and kill us. There's 20 of them up there. Amen. But if they say, come up here, we will climb a cliff knowing that God's going to put them into our hand. And you know what the armor bearer said? All right. Yeah, come on. All right. You, you, you feel good about that? All right. Let, let, let's do this thing. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. And I, I got too big of a mixed crowd to tell you what verse 11 actually means. Let me say it like this. No, don't say it, Jerry. If you saw Braveheart, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistine, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes where they're hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. Jonathan said, well, there it is. God's going to give them to us. Let's go. He said to the armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them to the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet and his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistine fell before Jonathan. For, which means walk behind him and his armor bearer. Fo the Philistines fell before Jonathan. His armor bearer followed and killed behind him. One fighting in the front, one fighting in the back. In the first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about a half an acre. What a fight. I read this stuff, man. I just it, My spirit comes alive. The word armor bearer in the Hebrew language is the word N-A-S-A. NASA. To lift up. I know what you're thinking. Well, that's kind of coincidental. <laughs> Amen. To lift up, to accept, advance, bear, furnish, give, help, hold up, lift, pardon, raise, regard, respect, to stir up, to have one's back. I got you back. Say it with me. I got you back. Say it again. I got, I'm going to tell you, dads would be better dads if they knew the kids had their back. Amen. We could be better brothers if we knew us brothers had each other's 
back. Amen. If we had each other. Do all that you have in mind, the armor bearer said. I, I, go ahead. I'm with your heart. And so the duty of that armor bearer was to stand beside his leader to assist him, to lift him up, protect him against any enemy that might attack him. The heart of the armor bearer provides strength for his leader. I'm going to provide strength. Now, I'm just going to throw these at you real quick. Uh, I'm not trying to imply anything. Amen. Here's what I know about leadership. Leadership is either through intimidation, manipulation, or inspiration. And if you are inspiring, Dad, your kids will pick up on it. If you're intimidating and you're manipulating, it's going to cost you later in life. So just be an inspiration. Can I get an amen? It's a great relief to a pastor, a leader, a dad to know that he does not have to carry physically, spiritually, and, and mentally all the time. That my staff, you know, I look at our staff that we got. I don't have to carry these guys. I don't have to carry the, the, the girls there or the guys. I don't have to. They figure things out. I don't have to have a lot of meetings. Amen. We drank coffee together. There was a day I used to have meeting after meeting after meeting. Don't do that no more. Because when you've got people around you who understand your heart, then they know what is, expect, what is expected of you. I've seen pastors war out. I've seen leaders war out with, their, with the people in their life. You know, I've been there at occasions. Don't want to go there again. Next thing is they have a deep down sense of respect for their leader. Again, this has to do with commanding because of your life, not because of your tongue. I mean, they, they accept you. They have a tolerance, even of leader's personality and his way of doing things. The Scripture says, honor your mother and father. Then it gives you a benefit. You know what the benefit is? That you may live long on the earth. Yeah. Honor your mother and father. Here's our problem. As me, I know that there are times I've not been a great dad. I know at times, men, we beat ourselves up when we not be great dads. Moms, you understand the same thing. There are times we feel like failures. We didn't get uh, parenting 101 when it came to dealing with our kids. That's why grandkids are such a blessing, because you get a second chance. And if you don't have grandkids, I got two coming. You can adopt them with me. Hey, man, I'll, I'll loan them out to you. I get tired of them after a few hours. <laughs> but the bottom line is we struggle. But watch this. The Scripture says, honor your mother and your father that you might live long on the earth. Honor has to do with their position, not their personality. And there are times the personality of a parent will grate on you, personality of a pastor will grate on you, an employer will grate on you, a husband will grate on you, but it's the position that they hold. So there are times in my life I look back and said, you know what, now I realize that, it, that God wasn't calling me to honor my dad's personality. My dad could cuss a paint off the wall. He invented words. He did. And I was just like him in so many ways. Even my mom will say at times, you're so much like your daddy. And there are times I see it, and some of you, you recognize, there are times, I promise you, you look in the mirror, and you see your old man looking back at you. Bless your heart, ladies. Honor them. Instinctively understand their, their thoughts. Amen. But we don't think alike. That's it. You don't think alike. That's the issue. No two people do. Stop complaining about the differences, amen, of the one that you're, you're armor bearing for and begin to discover and confess your agreement. Learn to flow. Learn to flow with a heart and soul. That's what he said. I'm with you. Heart and soul. You want to go? Let's go. You climb? I'll climb. You take the front? I'll take the back. We'll do that. Walk in agreement with them. Amen. Walk in agreement with them. God will never establish you as an authority until you have first learned to submit to authority. I, I've served two pastors, three pastors, three. I've served them to the best of my ability. Amen. They all three had different personalities. One always wore a suit and tie. I mean, always. Anytime you saw, except on the golf course, he always had a suit and tie on. Amen. I, I loved that man. I served him in San Antonio for four years. He was a dignitary of the city. People loved him. Amen. He, he gave me my first opportunity to preach. I'll never forget to get to preach. I was a young man. I, you know what I did for him? I vacuumed his floors. I cleaned his toilets. I looked after this man. I was in college. I, I, I did whatever I could to serve him. Amen. I ran the sound system for the church. And then one day he looked at me and he said, Jerry, would you like to preach here? This is one of the largest churches in San Antonio. Would you like to preach here on a Sunday night? Oh, yes, I would. He said, good. Do you have a, a tie? Sir, do you have a tie? I said, no, sir. I don't have a tie. He said, okay, I'll get you one. I, I got you a tie. You got a jacket? Uh, no, sir, I don't have a jacket. I'll get you one. At that time, I was probably 180 pounds, and, and one of the board members, an elder, gave a jacket to, for me to wear, and it was a size of 42 long, which means my little fingers were sticking out of the ends of them right here. I went and bought a shirt. I did not know. This is how, this is just how I was. And you say, Pastor, there's no, yeah, this is it. I didn't understand this shirt size. I knew large, 
medium, extra large. I didn't know what 15 and a half, 15 means. So I had a color shirt, about that color you got on that salmon looking color. That, that's what I was told it was called. Amen. Salmon, like a fish, I guess. Amen. But, it, but so the shirt come up to here on me. The jacket came to here on me. And I had a pair of, of striped denim stripes, bell bottom jeans that had that little salmon stripe running down it that matched that shirt. Running down. And it went all the way down to my dingoes. You follow the okay? And I get there and he gives me a tie to put on to match this. Blue jacket, salmon shirt, goofy looking tie, striped jeans, dingo. First sermon. Biggest church, San Antonio. I tore it up. <laughs> Can I tell you something else? The armor didn't fit me. The jacket was off pretty quick. But I just did Jerry. I just preached the best I could. And it began to open doors for me. That's what that man did. But I served that man. And then it opened a door for the next man that I came and served. And I served him. And I served when I was a young uh, children's pastor, and youth pastor in Alabama. I just served him. Amen. Because in, you can never be served until you first serve. Many times people, want, they want to be served, but you never served. Amen. You never waited on tables. You never, you, when you wait, you don't you wait. I'm watching Bethany right now. She's taking notes right now. You know what she's, when, when a waiter comes to the table and to ask me what I want, I like to see them taking notes. I like to see them write it down. I'll say stuff like this. I want a double cheeseburger with crispy bacon, burn the onions. These guys would be with me in places, and they know I want my onions burnt. Did you know it's impossible to burn onions on a grill? What I'm saying is get them as done as good as you can. Amen. And, and, I, and they write that down, I feel good. There are times that I'll say something to somebody, I like to see them write it down to understand what it is exactly that we want, to communicate one another. Make the advancement of your leader the most important goal. This is what armor bearers did. Amen. Let's do that for our fathers a little bit more. Possessive, possesses an endless strength so as to thrust, press, and force their way onward without giving way under harsh treatment. Do you know most of the time the armor bearer was always younger than the man they're serving? Which means that they got more strength. And as you hit a certain age in life, you thank God for the young pups around you. Amen. That can lift and pick up. And then every now and then you need to remind them. I used to do that too. But twice as much. Amen. Of course, there ain't no pictures. We ain't got no pictures to prove it when you're my age. Uh, let's keep going here. I got to close. Uh, follow orders immediately and correctly. Again, write it down. Ask questions if you don't understand. Amen. Treat it with priority. Be a support to your leader. Be a support to your father. Supporter means that which upholds, sustains. That, that couldn't be anything uh, worse than getting ready to go for battle knowing you didn't have an armor bearer. Even Goliath had an armor bearer. He had somebody that stood in front of him with, with, with armor. Have a disposition that will eagerly gain victories for, their, for your leader, your dad. Amen. Represent them. When people are away from here, as I prayed over folk going to Kentucky, you got to represent me. Amen. You're representing this house. You're representing the people of this house and the God of this house. Amen. So like the armor bearer, go ahead. I'm with your heart and soul. The word courage means bravery. The ability to encounter difficulties and danger with firmness. And as I'm reading this today, I thought to myself, and I, I was telling a friend of mine, I said, you know I'm going to preach on? He said, Pastor, you ain't preached on that in 20 years. I said, no, but I think it's the missing thing for men to understand that we need to have each other's back. How much better of a father would you be? Stepdad would you be? Guardian would you be? Brother you would be if you had another brother help you, have your back. You know, sometimes I don't even talk to my kids. I get frustrated with them. And one of my brothers will talk to them for me. They won't even tell me. But they see the hurt I carry, the pain in my heart, and they'll go to my kids and they'll talk to them. And there's times I've talked to your children without your permission about how to be a better son or daughter to you. See, the issue is to me, Joshua 1, 1 says, after the death of Moses, 
the servant of the Lord. The Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. He was a minister to the minister. He looked after Moses. You know, by the time Moses was 80, he was heading out of Egypt. He's 120 when God takes him off the scene. Joshua served him 40, 50, 60 years. We don't know how, when he came in his life, but he served him at least 40 years. He ministered to him. He waited his time. The word there in the Hebrew language means to attend, to contribute, to wait on, to serve. Joshua's duty was to wait on Moses to contribute to his success. So my question would be this. Would there have been a promised land without Joshua serving Moses? I don't know. It sure would have been different. Would there have been a little country church had it not been for the men in this house that showed up to aid a struggling preacher? Would there have been? H, I don't think so. You see, my success is predicated on the fact that you love me. My success is predicated on the fact that you got my back. My success is predicated on the fact that you've been sensitive, secured, provided, and it should reciprocate. So I say to every man in this house, we need to have each other's back. Wives, you want to see that man become a better husband? Have his back. Defend him. Sometimes kids, and if you've got step families, it could get difficult. Defend him. Uh, yeah, you know why? Because you know his weaknesses. Oh, my God, you know his weaknesses. You know his stumbles. You know his failures. Did you know that that armor bearer knew Jonathan's? David knew Saul's. He knew, but he loved Saul's a dad. He loved him as a dad. Every, every man in the house stand up. Not every father, every man. You got hair under your arms, you man. If you got hair on your face, I don't need to talk to you. You know it. Now, a couple weeks ago, I purchased these. And uh, here you go, David, hold this for me. And uh, if I opened them up and you saw them, you'd say, Pastor, that looked like a chip. That looked like a gambling chip. Church of the Little Country, Church of the Holy Wild, New Caney, Crosby, Texas. It looked like a chip. I know it looked like a chip. Hold on just a minute. Hold on just a minute. I'll get back with you in a second. Well, Boudreaux was in Livingston Parish, and every Friday he was frying that back strap. Ooh, the Catholic Church got mad at him because they could smell that back strap. Every Friday, every Friday they smell it. They smell that backstrap come across there. They know that the custom is you got to eat fish on Friday. Catholics eat fish. They don't eat deer. So they sent the priest down after Boudreaux. He told Boudreaux, he said, Boudreaux, he said, you got to quit, quit cooking that deer meat, that venison on Friday. He said, we eat fish. And Boudreaux said, well, I don't understand. He said, well, you, you need to become a Catholic. He said, well, how do I do that? He said, well, come down to the church. And came down to church, and he said, you were born a Cajun, raised a Cajun, threw water on him. He said, now you Catholic. Boudreaux said, all right, a Catholic. So Boudreaux go home. Friday, you could smell the venison cooking again. He cooking there again on Friday. And they walked over, and they saw, they saw Boudreaux standing over the grill. And he looked down at that deer meat, and he took his water, and he said, you were born a deer, you were raised a deer, and now you're a catfish. <laughs> All right? Listen, listen. It might look like a chip, but this morning it's a coin. All right? You follow me? This is now a coin. Every man in this house, I want to put one of these in your hand. And I want to tell you, we got you back. We got you back. 
Come on, man, right here down the aisle. Okay. Amen. Give all these dads a hand, all the men in the house. <clears throat> I knew I'd take a chance on preaching this today. But, sir, if you know somebody got your back, it makes life so much easier. Amen. Wives have their back. Moms have their back. You know, I know my mom got my back. I knew that when she'd drive that pink station wagon down to New Bethel Junior High and chew them teachers out for messing with her boy. That's how mama's are, ain't it? Amen. Then she'd come home and beat the fire out of you. <laughs> Amen. If you need to tie the offer envelope right in front of you, the opportunities to give. You're watching online. I thank you for watching. I want to tell you, there have been men that I would give these coins to that are not a part of this church today. They've, they've moved away. And I thank you like Richard Golightly and Don Nash. You know, men have been a part of my life for a long time. I can think of other men, too. But they've had my back, you know, and I've traveled. They've traveled with me. They were sensitive toward things, and I appreciate the, the men that God had put around me. Amen. David, if you come up and finish this out, uh, H, y'all ready for the offering? Okay, come on. Who's, who's doing it? Travis? They're going to pass the bucket. So I'm going to say this with you. As we give today, we're believing God for? Less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. If you're giving online, show your phone to the servant leaders when they go by. Amen. Let them see your phone. Say, I'm giving online. Thank you for those who give online at holywild.net slash give. Amen. Give it up for your pastor. Grateful for him, for the gift he is to this church, not only to this church, but to the to the kingdom. Amen. For all those men that he has fathered that are continuing.